I just want to say that this is a speech that I gave uh, at the request of the JACL in their day of remembrance. And so it was presented for a, uh, the local audience and not necessarily, you know, Christian. And uh, this is what I'm presenting. Now, why should we have a day of remembrance? Why should we talk about something that happened half a century ago? Who cares? And it's not just for sentimental reasons that we recall these painful experiences. It's because we don't want it to happen again. I'm especially concerned that the young people will pay attention and just, just know what's going on in the world and, and, and get involved at whatever level you're comfortable at. And so this is the purpose of, of me being willing to do it because it is very difficult. It has been very painful for me. And I've also written it out and I'm reading it because if I don't, then I'm, you're going to be here for a whole hour. With mixed feelings, I have been looking backward over the past 48 years. However, the best thing about looking backward is you know how it is going to end. Life has been a series of good news and bad news. Look backward, says the historian. History has a way of repeating itself. Learn from the mistakes of others. Look inward, pleads the psychologist. Understand yourself. Look outward, says the sociologist. Understand your fellow human beings and sympathize with them. Help them in their needs. As I pondered what I might say, I realized my life's process had included looking backward, inward, outward, forward, and most importantly, upward to God. I was born and reared in Alameda, California, which is a city next to San Francisco. There were 10 of us children, and my parents were operating a dry cleaning store. Between December 7, 1941 and May 1942, many big changes occurred in our family. Four older children were already out of the home, one of them having just volunteered for the U.S. Army. I was a student at San Francisco State College. Two sisters got married and went off to the rural areas of California, rumors being you would be safe from evacuation. One sister who aspired to be a singer left for Denver, her eventual goal to get to Juilliard. I mention these details because it was traumatic for me to adjust to these rapidly changing unnatural situations. So, when evacuation orders became a reality, my two sisters ended up in different camps, one having to endure the harshness of the Arizona heat and dust storms, and the other the bitter cold of the Colorado winters. May 1942 then, for my parents, two brothers, and myself, evacuated to Tan Faran Assembly Center, which is a few miles south of San Francisco, to a, a hastily converted camp from a racetrack for 10,000 of us. My parents were forced to just close the doors of their business and leave. And what we could carry in a suitcase, sheets and blankets, and just a few personal clothing was what we took. Time has blotted out my memory of many details, mercifully, but the imagery of those early days and weeks at Tanforan still trigger feelings of grief and loss, humiliation, rage, despair, and feelings of powerlessness. For example, I cannot describe all my feelings when I stepped inside the horse's stall, which would be our home for the next six months. The odor of the previous occupants could not be eradicated with the whitewash they had put on the walls. Other remembrances of standing in line for our first meals, holding our tin cups and plates, or going to the latrine and showers which had no doors or curtains, or being stopped by an armed guard as I searched for the latrine at night. Where do you think you're going, I was asked. We had not been allowed to take any flashlights and I had lost my way and wandered toward the gate. The lack of privacy, not only within our own cabin with each other, but with our close neighbors, was cause for more feelings of despair and pain. One of my sisters, one of the ones who went to Arizona, who was a newlywed, just recently shared with me her feelings of humiliation, rage, and pain of the early days and weeks. So, high priority for them when they first arrived in camp was looking for material 
to stuff the large knot holes in their cabins for privacy. She, felt, she said she felt as if her legs had been cut off to the future. When the impact hit her, she cried bitterly. I too cried for a couple of weeks, every night under my covers. Then I decided I had to make the best of it. Thank God for the flexibility and adaptability of the human spirit. A community was beginning to form at Tanforan. All able-bodied adults were expected to work. Since I wanted to be a nurse, I volunteered to work in the camp hospital. For a 40-hour week, I received $8 a month. The physicians were paid a little more, $19 a month. I plunged into the work with enthusiasm. I'm glad, though, I never had to be the patient. I want to share one interesting experience. A patient needed emergency surgery, which could not be done at the camp hospital, and so was being transferred to a hospital in San Mateo. I was asked to accompany him in the ambulance. It was a glorious, exhilarating feeling just to be riding on the highway. After the patient had been hospitalized, we stopped to buy a hamburger. I don't know which tasted better, the hamburger or the brief moment of freedom. At this time, I want to say something about my mother. Both my parents were Christians, but my mother had the greatest impact on all of us children. She was our anchor, our rock. She was always a quiet, gentle, nurturing woman, and her rock of faith was anchored in a God who would not desert us, no matter how bad life seemed. I hope I'm going to get through this. Not once did she criticize the U.S. government, and when we asked her how she felt about the Japanese government, she said her heart hurt, but that she had chosen America, and this was her country now. Eventually, my three brothers in camp volunteered to join the U.S. military. They and my parents were severely criticized by people who opposed this and even threatened them. And some cooks were so mean in the mess halls, they gave my parents less food as punishment. My mother became a four-star mother, and my parents left Topaz in 1945. Back to my story. I couldn't afford nurses' uniforms, so I was fortunate in having Shig Horio, who later became my husband, supply me with uniforms and other necessities. He and his family had moved from San Francisco to Salt Lake City in voluntary evacuation, one jump ahead of the force group. In other words, they had about two weeks. If you had a house, a place to go, and a job, and you could leave, you know, people were free to leave, but there weren't too many people like that. However, Shig was having his own problems. He had completed two years of medical school at the University of California and was trying to get into another school. Fate was kind, and he was able to enter the third year at the University of Utah. Meanwhile, he worked on the railroad and as a busboy at Hotel Utah. I'm going to digress a minute. And I, was, I've been share, I was sharing with a couple of the church members that the most interesting, touching part of the story I can't tell you publicly because I would just stand here and, and cry. Fate was kind again when the population at Tanforan was transferred to Topaz, Utah for our permanent relocation center. I'm going to skip the details of our early weeks there because my story will get too long. Early on, thanks to Shig sponsoring me, I was able to leave Topaz to attend the University of Utah. By then, camp restrictions were being lifted to allow students to leave or seasonal workers to go out to work. While I was overjoyed and being out of camp, my troubles were only beginning. It was very difficult being separated from my family, being in a strange city having no money, and then being told that they would not accept me in their nursing school because they did not know what to do with a Japanese American. Other nursing schools expressed the same attitude. Can you imagine any school or agency saying today, we don't know what to do with you because you are Japanese American? Those were disturbing times for me, and I dropped out to assess what I would do with my life. Meanwhile, I worked as a domestic for my room and board. Twenty-three years later, my husband suggested I go back to school, and I received my master's degree in social work in 1970. The irony of life was that our commencement speaker at the university was Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was the Attorney General in California at the time of the war hysteria. 
Subtle indirect discrimination profoundly affected and changed our lives. Chig had tried to volunteer for commissioning in the U.S. Army, but had been turned down because of race. So when the war was over, the returning veterans received higher priority than non-veterans for residency training in medicine. However, in 1953, married with three children, four years into private practice with thousands of borrowed dollars to start the practice, Uncle Sam tapped him for service in the Korean War. That was the bad news. The good news was he was assigned to Hawaii, and we never returned to San Francisco to live. And now I want to say something about my brothers and sisters and their experiences. When I was asked to speak on my internment experiences, I wrote to four of them asking them to just share one or two remembrances which I could add with mine. And this is the first time after all these years we had done this, all of us being separated geographically. My oldest brother John left Topaz in 1943 to volunteer for military service and was trained as a Japanese language specialist at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. He was selected as a speaker for their graduation exercises. In his speech, he stated that his parents were being held in camp as hostages of the U.S. government. While he was heartened by the strong round of applause from his fellow classmates, later he was severely chastised by a high-ranking general who followed him as a speaker. His master's thesis, when he went back to school after the war was over, his master's thesis on legislative history and administrative procedures of the Evacuation Claims Act was widely quoted in the courts and at con congressional hearings on reparations to internees. His entire professional career was devoted to opening up equal opportunities for minorities, both in job and in the right to eat in any restaurant. In addition, he became an active member of the JACL, Japanese American Citizens League, in both Chicago and Washington, D.C. My sister Ruby, the, the would-be singer, uh, ended up becoming a voice therapist. Uh, she got married. She lived in New York City. She became widowed. And uh, after her husband died, she became a very active JACLer. And when she became president, she opened up her home as a JACL office until she became ill and died three years ago. My brother Joe shared a funny remembrance with me. He worked as a security officer with the princely sum of $4 a month. So I, were, I earned $4 more than he did. I didn't know that. One of his duty stations was to be at the post exchange when goods came in. Remember, this was wartime and goods were scarce. The ladies would line up when they heard sanitary napkins were available. One day, when a teenager did not get to buy any, she became angry and kicked my brother in the shins. She survived, and today she is a practicing physician. On a more serious note, Joe volunteered for the 442 even though he had a wife and young baby. He felt no one would hear their cries behind barbed wires. Sad note about Brother Joe, his wife died from a brain aneurysm at the age of 42. My sister Sue also became a social worker. Like me, she too went back to school when the children were almost grown and earned her bachelor's and master's degree. Her entire career was as a minority counselor at San Francisco State College. Another sister, Aiko, went back to college and received a bachelor's degree and worked for the U.S. Navy. When I asked her about her remembrances, she said she had nothing but negative remembrances. She didn't want to tell me anything. However, one of them was when, after being released from camp, she and her husband had gone to a restaurant in Price, Utah, and had been refused service. The impact hit her hard, and she finally could identify with what the blacks had suffered for so long. She became active in the redress movement and went to Washington, D.C. to testify. I am thankful for those many individuals and organizations who worked so hard for redress. I am hoping my 90-year-old mother will hang in there so she can receive her check. Sad to say, her only surviving son, my brother-in-law, just died in January. So here I am, still working as a social worker. My three children are all married, and I have one precious grandson. My husband died in a car accident in 1976. In addition to work, I am committed and active in peace and human rights activities. 
In 1983, when it wasn't a popular thing to do, a small group of us went to the Soviet Union on a peace mission. The Soviets thanked us for coming with tears in their eyes. Last year, as most of you know, I had the unexpected opportunity to go to South Africa. Two of us carried missions money from our church to the first school for black girls, which had been established by American missionaries 100 years ago. It was an eye-opening experience to talk with whites, blacks, and coloreds about apartheid and what was happening in their country. The blacks were amazed and touched that we were concerned enough about their plight to come halfway around the world. In conclusion, the bad news was the forced internment. The good news is the process of my own spiritual journey through life in which my vision expanded to include the whole world. Mom was right. God was and still is faithful and continues to guide me. I close with a paraphrased quote from John Donne. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thank you.